The scientific claims of intelligent design are pretty thin. One claim is something called irreducible complexity, which is promoted by um, Michael Behe in his book Darwin's Black Box. The other is the idea of the design inference from William Dembski's book of the same title and many other publications. Complex specified information or specified complexity, if you will. Both of these are pretty much the same idea. At heart, uh, these two scientific ideas, in terms of, of their definition, refer to the fact that there is terrific complexity in nature and that this complexity is unexplainable through natural causes, uh, either because of its complexity in, in Behe's terminology or because of its improbability in Dembski's probability or Dembski's uh, uh, parlance. Schematically, you can look at intelligent design as follows. Stuff like, s stuff, phenomena on the planet that exhibit specified complexity or irreducible complexity could either be explained by chance or by natural causes like natural selection. Clearly, it is absurd to assume that chance could produce something like the vertebrate eye. Clearly, they say, it is absurd to assume that something like natural selection could produce irreducible complexity, since the heart of irreducible complexity is the idea that all components of a complex system have to be there at one time. Therefore, they couldn't be put together incrementally, which is what natural selection requires. Therefore, say the intelligent design proponents, intelligent design <laughs> is the explanation for this phenomenon. Now, it happens to be the case that scientists disagree that natural selection is incapable of explaining these things. I mean, the intelligent design promoters are just simply wrong when it comes to understanding natural science. Most scientists also disagree profoundly that intelligent design is a scientific idea whatsoever. We all agree chance does not produce complexity. <laughs> If you are unsure about that, please be assured that evolution is not a chance phenomenon. Natural selection, which is the major engine of, end, of evolution, is adaptive differential reproduction. There are chance elements involved in the production of the genetic variability upon which natural selection operates, but natural selection is not a chance um, process. A, a major misunderstanding about evolution. So basically, what the intelligent design people are saying is that chance and scientific processes, chance and, and evolution, can't explain something, therefore intelligent design explains it. Where have we heard this before? This is very much like the creation science two-model approach, in which disproving evolution proves, oopsie, intelligent design. Now, getting back to Scalia's dissent, I want to talk now about the current um, evidence against evolution school of anti-evolutionism, because I think this is of, of great interest and people need to know about it. Scalia wrote in his dissent that it was perfectly legal to teach the evidence against evolution. This was seized upon immediately, literally the month after the Edwards decision came down by the Institute for Creation Research. Wendell Bird wrote that school boards and teachers should be strongly encouraged to at least stress the scientific evidences and arguments against evolution in their classes, not just the arguments against some supposed evolutionary mechanism, but against evolution per se, against the idea of common ancestry, even if they don't wish to recognize these as evidences and arguments for creation. Evidence against evolution proves creationism. That is the way these people think, and that if you understand that, you'll understand why they are proposing the kinds of laws and, and regulations that they propose these days. Now, in this uh, quote from the um, ICR uh, Impacts newsletter, uh, Wendell Bird is talking about school boards and teachers. Something happened in the late 80s and 90s that uh, gave a new window to anti-evolutionism, and that was the establishment in the United States of science education standards. This was actually a product of the Bush One administration. In 1989, the National Governors Association had a meeting at which uh, the first President Bush was uh, present, and uh, President Clinton um, was a governor, and the decision was made that the United States needed to have some more continuity from place to place about education. So standards in mathematics and history and science uh, were proposed. And these would be, of course, because we have local control here in the United States uh, of education, the 
national standards in these various disciplines would, of course, be merely advisory. But it did stimulate a great deal of thinking throughout the 90s. Uh, the National Science Education Standards, the kind of yellow document there, was prepared by the National Academy of Sciences uh, through a great deal of cons consultation with master teachers and scientists all over the country, a very long process of critique and consensus for about four years so that everybody was pretty much on the same page. And then the National Science Education Standards, even if they weren't uh, required to be adopted by the states, tended to be cloned by the states simply because all of the state education officials were involved in this process. It was a very smart way of doing it, much smarter than the history standards that really ran into a buzzsaw. So most of the state science standards require the teaching of evolution. Most of them use the E-word, um, but even if the word evolution is not there, the concept of common ancestry and, of course, natural selection and adaptation and so forth are in the science education standards. Now, if you're a creationist, you're seeing evolution coming into your, um, into your uh, uh, science education standards, you're going to want to do something about it. And over the years, this is just a small selection from 2000 to 2005, the National Center for Science Education uh, ran into lots of cases where either alternative theories to evolution or evidence against evolution was being proposed in science education standards around the country. Uh, in virtually every case here where you see a yes by the state, the, um, it was proposed but it was actually not passed. It wasn't passed because civic-minded citizens like yourselves, scientists and teachers and civil libertarians went to those school board meetings and testified and argued against the uh, inclusion of non-scientific ideas in the science frameworks. I want to use as an example the state of Texas. Um, Texas has had a long history of trying to discredit evolution. Back in the 70s, there was actually a disclaimer pasted into science textbooks in Texas that uh, declared evolution was a theory, not a fact, etc. Now, most science education standards have two parts. This is worth knowing because it gives you a little bit of a roadmap here. One part of the science education standards in Texas or any place else are called the process skills or the science as a way of knowing. They're sort of general statements about um, how do you, you know, what's an experiment and what's a theory and, and how do you do science. The second component of science education standards are the content standards. In physics you teach optics and you teach the concept of mass. In, um, in biology, you teach, you teach cells and you teach evolution. So the two different sections of the standards are a bit different and um, uh, they refer to different things. The standards of each state are devised by a committee of teachers and scientists that's appointed for that purpose. And the Texas standards are called the Texas Educational Knowledge and Skills, T-E-K-S or TEKS. The TEKS were developed in 1998, and they have two major parts. In the process skills is a standard called 3A. The student is expected to, quote, analyze, review, and critique scientific explanations, including hypotheses and theories, as to their strengths and weaknesses using scientific evidence and information. Now, that's kind of a funny way of, of stating a critical thinking standard, but itself it's not too weird. And it occurs, by the way, throughout all of the TEKS. Here are the, uh, here's process skill three for chemistry and biology, and you can see that basically it's the same thing. Um, I'm not sure I can read that. Um, analyze, review, and critique scientific explanations, including hypotheses and theories as to their strengths and weaknesses using scientific evidence and information. True of chemistry, of physics, of environmental science, across the board. And the other statements in the process skills are the same. Uh, sci evaluate the impact of research on scientific thought, society, and the environment. Um, describe the connection between biology and future careers, between um, chemistry and future careers. You get the idea. Generally speaking, these process skills apply across the board to all the sciences. Now, the thing about the TEKS is that they are a very strong statement from the state of Texas as to what textbooks have to include in order to be bought by the state to be um, used by the teachers. Texas buys a whole lot of textbooks. It's a really big state. It adopts from K through 12. 
California is a bigger state, but California only adopts K-8, so it doesn't have the clout as Texas does. Too bad. Anyway, Texas adopts, buys a whole lot of textbooks, so pretty much what Texas wants is what you're going to get.